in just two weeks and three days will come the Passover once again. What, after all, is the real meaning of the Passover? We take it every year. I forgot to count the number of years that this will be for me. I think it's about 56 at least. Maybe 57. I'll have to count it again. Probably longer than any of you. And it seems that we just take it year after year, and if we're not careful, we'll just take it for granted, like so many other things, as routine, without thinking of the meaning of it. But it's one of the most important occasions in our lives. And it comes every year to remind us of the meaning of it every year. And I wonder, are we all really ready for it? Well, we have two weeks and three days to get ready if we're not. I'd like to read to you from 1 Corinthians 11, beginning with verse 22, or 27, rather. 27, 28. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread at the time of the Passover and drink of the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be uh, uh, guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, unworthily doesn't mean that you are worthy to take it. It is referring to the manner in which you do it and the condition in which you are when you do it as to whether you do it worthily or not. But then it continues, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of this bread and drink of this cup. Now, verses 29 on to 30, the next two verses, refer to the meaning of the bread, the broken body of Jesus Christ. You and I have sinned. Every one of you has sinned. The trouble is a lot of people don't stop to really confess and admit that. We seem to take it for granted we're just pretty good. We don't realize how unworthy we really are ourselves. But it's talking here about both the blood and the body of the Lord. Now, Jesus' body was broken for us, for our healing. So we read in the next two verses here, 29th and 30th, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, that is the manner in which you do it, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, which was broken for us and for our healing when we're physically sick. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Many have had some kind of a sickness or disease that they have died, and they sleep. That is the Bible language for the fact that they are dead. It represents death as being in a type of sleep. When you're asleep, unless you have a dream, you're unconscious until you wake up. And even a dream, you seem to be in some crazy circumstance. You wonder why and how it ever happened. And we dream some very funny and foolish things sometimes. But Jesus' blood was shed because of our spiritual sins, the transgressions of his spiritual law. Now, all sickness and disease is a result of sin, and a lot of you don't realize that. It doesn't always mean that you have deliberately had a wrong attitude or wrong intention and have deliberately sinned and caused it by your own wrong thoughts, motivations, and actions. 
It could be an accident. It could be a germ in some water you drank. It could be a contagious disease, I suppose, or something of that sort. But nevertheless, it is something that disrupted the natural rhythm of the laws of your body. The body was made to function in a certain way. And sometimes I wonder how the heart keeps on beating so long. I know sometimes if I turn in my bed in sleeping over on the left side, on the pillow, I, I will hear my heart thumping, and I sometimes have to turn over on the other side to get away from hearing it. And it's, it's strange that that heart just keeps going, going, going. Now, of course, we have to fuel ourselves with uh, food and water from the ground, and we came from the ground ourselves. But nevertheless, as long as we have the fuel and we breathe the air, we breathe the air automatically, and you don't even think about it when you're sleeping. It's just, I guess, the condition of the heart just keeps you automatically breathing. Something does. But it's a remarkable thing. I often think when we're flying in the G2 across the ocean, what if something happened that the engine stopped? There's no place to land out there. Absolutely no place. And sometimes I think of that funny uh, record that came out several years ago uh, about the, uh, let's see, it was Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Ferguson's uh, Airplane and Storm Door Company, I believe it was. It was just a comic thing. Uh, it, it was a uh, uh, a little small plane, a little small prop plane, uh, economy class going to Hawaii, and, and uh, uh, the captain gave an announcement after they had taken off, and said, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking, and this is not a case where he said we have both good news and bad news, but... And it sounded to me like it was mostly bad news, but it was funny. And he said, uh, of course, we believe that what the people want is economy. So he said, now, we do have just one little bit of luxury. You people traveling first class have straps to hang on to. The rest of you don't have any straps. But everybody had to stand. There were no seats. And someone then asked the captain, he asked for questions. Someone asked him, well, what if we should have to ditch? How long would we remain afloat? Oh, he says, lady, he says, that, 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 that's hard to tell, but some of them just go down like a rock. <laughs> I have to think, I hope that that engine keeps going just like the human heart does. And yet you don't know what second your heart's going to stop. You just don't know. Did you ever think to be thankful to God that he keeps your heart just going, 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 going? And it just goes automatically. You don't have to wind it up or anything except by eating of food and drinking of water. But the thing is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there's one thing I'd like to get straight. I often think of this, and I think this is the time of year when we need to be thinking about it. Does the blood of Christ alone save you? Does that get you into the kingdom of God? Now, Catholics and Protestants believe that if you are, quote, saved, unquote, that you go to heaven when you die. Otherwise, I think the Catholics believe you go to purgatory, and Protestants, and, and after that you'll go to hell if they don't pray you out of it, but... Protestants believe you go straight to hell, a fire that is burning, 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 and you keep burning forever and ever, but you never burn up. You, you, you have to go through that torture continuously forever. That'll keep going just like your heart does for a lifetime. But this heart only pumps for a lifetime. The average age is about 70. Some of us live about 20 years longer as I have now. 
but not many. And no one that we have any record of has ever lived the first thousand years. Methuselah lived 900, what was it, 60-something. Adam lived 930 years. They don't live that long, or in, uh, long anymore, and they haven't, not since the time of Abraham, and uh, shortly after the flood. But they believe that all you have to do is accept Jesus Christ, and the blood of Christ saves you. Now, the blood of Christ does not save anybody. You read that in the fifth chapter of the book of Romans. I don't want to take time to go into that this afternoon. But you will find there that we'll be saved by Christ, but not by his shed blood. And we're not saved by the death of Christ. We are reconciled to God the Father by the death of Christ. But we are to be saved by his resurrection and through our own resurrection made possible by his resurrection. Now, again, a lot of people think if they're baptized, they're saved. And I'm afraid too many of us in this church have believed that. And that's one thing I hope to correct now today. So, oh, yes, I, I'm a baptized member. Well, if you're baptized, that means you're a Christian. You're in the church. Oh, no, it does not, brethren. I don't care how many times you've been soused in water. And I don't mean to ridicule the very sacred or, uh, ordinance of baptism. But for many, that's all it is, just a sousing in water. I'd like to read just a few scriptures along that line right now before we pass on. Mark the... Uh, 7th chapter in verses 6 on to 9. Jesus said, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me. They not only accept Christ, they not only believe in Christ, but they worship him, and they do it in vain. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men and making the commandments of God of none effect by your tradition. Let's see. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. And then he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may hold to your own tradition. I was thinking of another scripture right along that line. Notice in Luke 13 now. Luke 13 and uh, verses 3 and 5. Jesus said, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now, he repeated that for emphasis in verse 5. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Regardless of how many times you've been baptized, if you have not repented, you shall all so likewise perish. I was thinking of, and I'd like to turn to that just a moment. It's in John, in the, uh, let's see, it's in the 8th chapter of John. I just happened to turn to it. As Jesus spoke these words, many believed on him. Now, here are people that believed on Christ. Then said Jesus to, these, to the Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you may be my, disciple, uh, my disciples indeed. And they began to dispute him right away. They didn't believe what he said. And so later, Jesus said, Why do you not understand my speech? That is what I'm saying, my speech. Even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father will you do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because 
there was no truth in it. When he speaks, he, uh, he, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. They believed on Christ, but they did not believe Christ. They did not believe what he said. So just accepting Christ, just believing on Christ doesn't save you. You have to believe what he says, and you have to repent. Now, there are the two conditions. One is repentance, and the other is faith. Now, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. You, be, you read in Mark, verse 1, chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then in verses 14 and 15. Now, after the John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel. What gospel? The gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent and believe. And except you repent. And I think a lot of people don't fully know what that means. They say, oh, well, I've repented. Yeah, I, I, I know I sinned. They haven't really repented because I think we do not understand what we mean by the word repent. Very few seem to understand it. You are not Christ until you have the Holy Spirit of God, and you cannot have the Holy Spirit of God until you have repented. If you turn now to Romans 8 and verse 9, which you ought to have memorized anyway, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have, or woman either, have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Without the Holy Spirit in you, and more than being in you, must be leading you. You must be following, must be led by the Spirit of God. Because then you will read, beginning in verse... Well, in verse 11, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make immortal your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. The Holy Spirit of God is the impregnation of eternal life, which you don't have. You were not born with life. You were only born with a chemical, temporary existence, just to exist a little while and then die. A lot of people die long before they're 70 years of age. Many people are facing death all the time. And people come and go. One generation comes and passes on and another generation comes along. But now you notice verse 11. I, I just read that in verse uh, 16. No, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Now, the Holy Spirit of God won't get hold of you and pull you. It won't get behind you and push you. It doesn't force you. It leads by opening your mind to understand the Word of God. Now, the Holy Spirit itself does not teach you. It opens your mind to comprehend what is taught. Jesus came and taught people who didn't understand. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't understand. Actually, the disciples were with him three and a half years, and they didn't comprehend and understand what he told them. Not all of it, not the spiritual part. And he said that when the Holy Spirit came upon them, which did him on the day of Pentecost, then he said that the Spirit of God would remain, and of course even the Spirit of man too, would bring to their remembrance what things he had taught them then they would come to understand it after the Holy Spirit came. You see, it is God who must teach you. And he teaches through Christ, who is the Word of God. And Christ teaches through his apostles and others under them. But it all comes from God. Now, when Jesus was here, he said he'd spoken nothing of himself. He only spoke what the Father told him to speak. 
And so all the teaching emanates originally from God Almighty, God the Father. Not from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in you will open your mind to comprehend the spiritual truth and spiritual knowledge. So you read in 1 Corinthians 2, and uh, beginning verse 9, I has not seen or ear heard, that is, neither has it entered into the mind of man, the spiritual truth, the things that God has prepared for us. Then the next verse says, the tenth verse, but God has revealed them to us. See, it comes from God, but he reveals it by and through his Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, otherwise you will not comprehend the real spiritual truth. Now, many people will understand a certain amount of the Bible because there's so much of the Bible that is, uh, well, relating to ordinary materialistic or physical knowledge as well as the spiritual portion of it. And much of it is history. And they can understand a great deal of the history. But when it comes to the real deeper spiritual teaching, the natural mind of man cannot comprehend. Now, it takes the words of the Bible that came from Christ, though, to teach and not the Spirit. Without the Bible and just having the Holy Spirit, you will never know any more. It is the Holy Spirit that opens the mind to comprehend. Now, it's just like the Spirit in man. I've talked to you so much about the Spirit in man. We're all born with a spirit, a human spirit. But that's quite a different spirit than the Spirit of God. That is a spirit that is in humans, and I know of no way to designate it except to call it a human spirit because it is, it's not flesh as we are, but it is in us who are flesh. It's in our flesh. And it does empower the physical brain with comprehension of materialistic knowledge. For example, a cow has a brain just like you do. You can take it apart and look at it. It's composed of the same thing your brain is. It's formed, formed and shaped just like your brain. Now, your brain might be a little bigger, but an elephant's brain is bigger than yours is. And it's just as good as yours and bigger and shaped and formed exactly, precisely like it. And yet even an elephant can't think, can't reason, can't come to comprehend physical knowledge. You stand by an elephant and try to teach the elephant some scientific facts about physics, chemistry, some of the laws of physics, some scientific knowledge, he doesn't know what you're talking about. He can't, his, his, his brain won't comprehend it, even though you teach him. You see, it is the spirit in us that causes our brain to comprehend materialistic knowledge. Still, that knowledge has to come either through the eye end of the brain, or the brain hears through the ear, or it tastes through the mouth, smells through the nose, and then the nervous through the senses of feel or touch or through the nerves, knowledge is transmitted. But the spirit itself doesn't transmit any knowledge to you. The knowledge has to come through sight or hearing, smelling, tasting, or feeling. No other way knowledge comes into your mind. Now, spiritual knowledge comes by teaching from God, but it can't be comprehended and it can't be understood except by the Spirit of God in you. With the Spirit of man, the human spirit, you can understand physical, materialistic knowledge that a dog, a cow, a horse, an elephant cannot understand, cannot comprehend. If you are taught, still someone must teach you, and the knowledge must come through the senses of sight or hearing or smelling or tasting or feeling. Now, likewise, the Holy Spirit does not teach you. You must be taught by, from God by the Word of God, and it's Christ is the Word of God. And the only way we have any knowledge, even the apostles, if I'm an apostle, I can teach you, but where do I get the knowledge? 
Where did Paul get the knowledge? Where did Peter, James, Andrew, where, where did the early apostles get the knowledge? From Christ. Well, I get it from the same source because Christ is the Word of God in person. The Bible is the same Word of God in writing. So I got it from the Word of God, but I got it in writing, and they got it through the ear from what they heard by his teaching. But it all came through Christ. He was the one who taught, not the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit opened their minds to comprehend. Brethren, we have not understood that until within the last year. It's a marvelous teaching that God has opened to us within the past year or so, and I hope that we can all come to understand it. I certainly thank and praise God for giving us that wonderful knowledge. Now, the conditions to receiving the Spirit, as Jesus said, repent ye and believe the gospel, the message, the truth. And the message is, comes from God. Believe what he says, in other words. Believe what he says. Now, let's turn to, uh, uh, turn now to Acts, the second chapter on the day of Pentecost. After Christ had ascended to heaven, he had been crucified. He had lived without sin. He never sinned. He did not have to repent because he had never sinned. But he paid the price of sin even though he didn't pay it for himself. He paid it for you and me. And he took your sins and mine on himself and paid the penalty for us. It's just like God is a great banker. And you owe the bank a lot of money. And Christ is the banker's son. And you can't pay what you owe the bank. But his son, the son of the banker, pays it for you and says, well, I paid that off for you, so you don't have to worry anymore about it. It's all paid. That is, you don't have to worry about the past sins. But you better worry about whether you sin any more in the future from now on, because then... Then you bring the penalty right back on yourself again if you do go on sinning anymore. Well, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came on those that had been taught by Christ and on a total of 120 people, more than just the original 12. There were about 10 times that many, a total of 120. And Peter preached the first really Spirit-inspired sermon by a human man on that day. And there were thousands there who heard him. And after Peter had finished his speech, it says in verse 37, Acts the second chapter, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. It touched their hearts, emotion. They were really hit. It wasn't just any common, ordinary thing. It, it was something that really, really hit them emotionally. They were touched in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What are we going to do now? Now that we've heard what we did and heard how Christ had been crucified. Then Peter said unto them, repent. But so many people don't know what he meant when he said repent. Repent and be baptized. Now, that follows repentance. Every one of you for the, every one of you for the remission of sins uh, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, there is no promise in the Bible that anyone will receive the Holy Spirit until after he has repented and been baptized. And being baptized is only an outward physical form or ceremony typifying, picturing, representing your real repentance and belief. You go down into the water, it's a picture of death, and the, the, the death of the old self, and as a type of the death of Christ. Coming back up out of the water is a picture of the resurrection of Christ, and you're coming up to live anew and a different a much-changed type of life, a different lifestyle. 
you're going a different direction from this time on. You're not going to be like the same person any longer. But some people haven't ever gone on any change. They're still just the same. They've just accepted a few uh, additional instructions or teaching or doctrines that they've heard. And they're so they're they're really so good, but uh, they say, well, you know, I want to do, I want to be good, I want to do what's right, and that's uh, I see that's true and that's right. So I'm so good, I'm just going to accept it. How many of you are like that, brethren? You just heard the truth, and you're so good that you say, yes, well, I, 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 in in my goodness, I'm I'm certainly going to accept that. Because I'm, I'm, I'm so good, I want to believe what's right. I don't want to do what's wrong. That won't save you and won't get to the Holy Spirit. I don't think that many of us have ever quite understood that yet, and we need to before we take the Passover. I sometimes have to wonder... I've had to all through these years if many of us understand just what it really means to repent. I read about 50, 55 years ago, back about that time, about the time of my conversion, might have been shortly after, of a story of a, a Methodist preacher. In fact, he was the bishop and had visited a church, and he was, he was a bishop, you see, and he was quite a celebrity coming to this small church. He'd come from a bigger city and was over a good many churches, and he was preaching on repentance. But somehow the people couldn't understand. He wasn't able to make them understand what he meant. And I think many of us, perhaps, do not understand just what we mean by repentance. So there was a black gentleman in the back of the church building, and he, he finally raised up his hand and said, If you please, sir, he said, I believe I could explain what you all mean, if, if, uh, if I might. Well, the bishop said, Certainly. Certainly, go ahead if you can make it more plain or clear to the people. Well, see, he said, I, uh, this is what I think you all mean. And he started walking right down the aisle, down toward the platform. And he says, I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell. And he got down to just in front of the platform. And then he turned around. And he started, and he walked rapidly back, even a little faster now. And he said, I'm going to heaven, I'm going to heaven, I'm going to heaven, I'm going to heaven. And when he got back up there, he said, I think what you all meant, sir, is we must turn around and go the other way. And some of them began to understand it. It meant you have to admit you've been going the wrong direction. You have to admit you've been wrong. You've believed wrong. You've lived wrong. You've done wrong. You are wrong through and through. And many of you have never admitted that. I've come to know even men that had risen up in this church to the rank of apostle, or not apostle, but of evangelist, and apparently have never admitted they had been wrong. They are just so good. They accepted the truth, and they've been accepting it. They believe and accept the doctrines in their own goodness, in their own righteousness, self-righteousness. And they haven't got any more real salvation than a cat, a dog, or a cow. A lot of people have come into this church, and a lot have become ministers, and they've gone through Ambassador College. They've been taught, but they never had the Spirit of God, and they never really comprehended the spiritual truth. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't teach you spiritual truth. 
it must be taught you, but the Holy Spirit enables your mind to understand it when you are taught. And I'm afraid some have not received the Holy Spirit even. Well, you'd better be sure, brethren, before you take the Passover. I want to speak on it this afternoon because I won't be here, I'm sorry, this year for the Passover. I'm going to have to be in Jerusalem. <laughs> and I've been there before on the Passover. I don't know why it's happened at least three or four years already. I've been in Israel at the Passover time. And I, uh, I've been there for, uh, I know once at least, I took the Passover in uh, brick and wood, and then on the preparation day after the Passover, I flew back over to Tel Aviv and was in Israel for the Holy Day. And I have been there for either the Passover or the Holy Day after about three or four times, and it seems like that's the way the schedule runs for this year, once again. Now, we are commanded to repent and believe before we are baptized, because baptism is only the outward ceremony picturing your belief and picturing the fact that you have repented that the old life is gone that you're now you've admitted how wrong you are and now you're starting a totally new type of life I would like to show you how the founder of the false church the founder of the false church was baptized and he wasn't converted and I hope that you're more converted than he was because he was just not converted and that's in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts Acts 8 beginning with verse 13 uh, this was Simon the sorcerer and this is the time when Philip had gone up to Samaria, you know, and preached the kingdom of God up there and preached Christ to them and the kingdom of God. And so, uh, uh, well, in verse 12, when they believed Philip, now they believed, preaching the things of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Well, I think it's, given to us to assume that they had repented we just say they believed then Simon this now he was the head of the Babylonian mystery religion there and they all looked up to him as a man of God from the least of them to the greatest in Samaria there then Simon himself believed now he believed he believed Christ he believed the truth I want you to notice that he believed also, and when he was baptized, and he was baptized, how many of you have believed? You've accepted the doctrine. You've been baptized. Well, that happened to the founder of what the Bible calls Babylon and tells us to come out of it. I'm going to read you that in just a minute. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. Now then, beginning with verse 20 on to verse 22. Peter and John came down and they didn't understand that they should lay hands on them for receiving the Holy Spirit. And they did not receive the Holy Spirit when they were baptized until the apostles came down and laid their hands on them and prayed that they would receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said unto him, Now, that Simon came and offered Peter money for the Holy Spirit. He had believed and he had been baptized. I want you to notice that. And now he came to Peter and said, uh, he asked, asked, said, I will pay money so you give me the Holy Spirit because he didn't get the Holy Spirit. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee because thou hast uh, uh, thought uh, 
that the gift of God, the Holy Spirit, the gift of God, may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. You know, uh, after Judas had dropped out and there were only 11 of the apostles left, they let the lot, which meant it was God's choice, fall on Matthias. And he became one of them. So he could have part in that, in, in that apostleship. The part and lot referred to being an apostle. And Peter said to him, you have neither part nor lot. You see, he wanted to be an apostle, and he made himself a, a, an apostle, pretended he was anyway afterward. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, Peter said to him. He had not repented, but he had believed. He had been baptized. Brethren, how about you? How about you? Do you know what repentance really means? Too many say, well, I, I, I guess I was a sinner, so I'm just going to believe now. And in your own goodness, you do. I don't believe that you... I don't believe that is repentance, brethren. I know it wasn't for me. I, could, I didn't get it that way. I didn't receive God's Spirit that way. I had to go through something that meant the death of this old self. It was already dead, and I didn't know it. But I had to let it die and let Christ put life in me through his Holy Spirit. I'll come to that a little later. But Peter said to him, Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. He had a wrong motive of heart. But he had repented. I mean, he had not repented, but he had believed and he had been baptized. Well, who are the followers of that Simon today? He went out anyway. And he organized what became finally the biggest religion in this world. What is known today as Christianity. He was the real founder of what the world looks on as Christianity today. And you find it described in Revelation 17 and verse 5, and it's in capital letters in my Bible and probably is in yours. Revelation 17, verse 5. And upon her she's pictured as a great whore, a great mama whore. And upon her forehead, and the church is always regarded in the female sense, because the true church of God is the affianced bride of Christ, to marry Christ at his second coming. But here was a false church, and she is a harlot, a whore, and she's a mother of harlots. And, when, and, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great. Or the Babylonian mystery religion becoming, having become great. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, her daughters came out of her in protest, as a daughter comes out of her mother at birth. And the Protestants came out of the Roman Catholic Church in protest, and that is called Christianity. And that was started by that same Simon. And he had the title of Peter. And he is the Simon Peter of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, Peter is often called, because E is often pronounced as A, and it would be pronounced Peter. Now, mater or mater means mother. And Alumni, graduates of a university, look on their university as their alma mater, or mother. Je Jesus, surnamed, uh, now wait, not Peter, but uh, Simon, his name originally was Simon, too. The sign of Bar-Jonah, or the son of Jonah. And Jesus surnamed him, and surname means gave him a title. And the title is, uh, look in the dictionary for surname. 
And you find twice in the Bible it says that he was surnamed uh, Peter. And surname is a title to designate your occupation. And that was the title that designated religious heads, religious leaders. And that's what they call the papacy, the Pope today. Well, now let's take a case history or two. Let's take the Apostle Paul, and uh, I'd like to turn to Acts, the ninth chapter. We'll go back to Acts again now, to the ninth chapter. And beginning with verse 1, I'd like to read the first 16 verses. I want you to get this experience that Paul went through. I want to give you some case history and see if you've had an experience, anything like this. His name originally was Saul from the city or town of, of uh, Tarsus. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and uh, slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, uh, uh, went to the high priest. He had hatred. He, he, he was energized by it. He, he was emotionally wrought up with hatred and vengeance against the Christians. He wanted to destroy them. He wanted to have them killed. So he went up to the high priest and desired of him uh, letters to Damascus, uh, to the synagogue, uh, that uh, uh, if he found any of this way, now, you see, this way, it's a way of life. You repent of your old way of life and turn to God's way of life. And what is God's way of life? It's the way God has always lived. You read the first beginning of God in John 1, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, for example, in verse 5 and so on. Where God and the Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was a personage. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and became Jesus Christ, verse 14. But the Word was with another person it's called God. And the Word also was God. Well, John can be with Smith, and, uh, but, but John is also Smith. Maybe he's Smith, uh, maybe uh, uh, John is Smith's son or Smith's father, one or the other. But Smith is the family name. And in this case, God is the family name. And that's why we coming into his family, begotten children, if we have really been begotten and received the Holy Spirit. We are begotten into the family of God, and that's why we're called the Church of God. Now, in the Old Testament, they were not the children of God. They were the children of Israel. They weren't called the congregation or Church of God. They were called the congregation of Israel. And Israel was Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and that was the name of Jacob. Israel. A human man. They were his physical descendants. But we are already, if we have the Spirit of God, his Spirit witnesses with our spirit, we are now already begotten as the children of God. So we bear the family name, Church of God. We're not Methodists. We're not Presbyterians. We're not Congregationalists. We're not Roman Catholics. We're the people of God. Brethren, do you realize this? Now notice. He wanted letters going up to the city of Damascus, which is today the oldest city in the world still existing, uh, to the synagogue, uh, that if he found any in this way, that is God's way of life, the Christian way that Christ had taught, uh, uh, whether... Uh, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem to be punished. He's going to imprison them. And as he journeyed, now this breathing swore, wanting to kill him. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus. 
Now, he must have gotten close to the outskirts of Damascus. And suddenly there shined uh, round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the prick. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? Something happened to him. He knew God had struck him, struck him down. And he was hit emotionally. He all of a sudden realized that he was actually persecuting God. And he was struck down blind. This was an emotional thing with him. But just emotion alone isn't enough. It wasn't really an emotional thing. It was a, it was a spiritual, mental thing, but I mean it had an emotional context, content. Because he, he, he really, it, it was a very serious thing with him. He, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now, he was given an order to see if he was going to obey. And the men which journeyed with him uh, stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, you see, he had been blind, uh, he saw no man, he was blind. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, blinded, and neither did he eat nor drink. Now, he went through quite an experience. This shook him up. Believe me, this shook him up. This was no just easy thing. He just heard something. Yeah, I'm so good, I guess I'll accept that. I wonder how many of you got into the church that way. How many of you were struck down till it really shook you to the roots, realizing how wrong you had been, admitting how wrong you were through and through? And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named uh, Ananias, and uh, to him... Uh, uh, said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And uh, the Lord said unto him, Arise and uh, go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judah uh, for one called Saul of Tarsus. Uh, for, behold, uh, he prayeth, and uh, hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias, who, who, who was, whom Christ was now talking to, uh, coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, uh, Well, Lord, I, uh, uh, I have heard by many of this man, uh, and how much evil he has uh, uh, done uh, to the saints of Jerusalem. You know, we've all been doing evil, but have we recognized it? Have we realized how evil we have been? Some of us have been so good, we have never had to repent. Some of you have been so good, you've never had to repent. Well, brother, and I did, or I wouldn't be up here teaching you today. And here, he has authority uh, from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, uh, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. Oh, he didn't volunteer at all. He wanted to go the other way. God called him. God knocked him down. God chose him. If you have been called, it's because God called you. But some of you weren't knocked down quite that bad. And some of you haven't undergone any such experience that really shook you up like this. Chosen vessel unto me, 
to bear my name before the Gentiles and before kings and the children of Israel. He had to go before kings. For I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul had to suffer many things for Christ. Brethren, I have had to suffer many things for Christ. And when I gave myself to him 55, 56 years ago, back in the very spring of uh, 1927, I knew that Jesus said if they persecuted him, they would persecute us. And I knew I would be persecuted. I counted the cost. And when I gave myself over to him, I did it knowing what I was going to have to suffer. And I have suffered it, and I'm suffering it right now this minute in ways that most of you don't understand at all, and I'm not going to reveal a lot of it to you. And I and Ananias went his way and entered into the house Let's see, I wanted to read. Now, that's as far as I needed to read. I just wanted to read that far to you to show you that experience that Paul went through. It was an experience, this conversion that he went through. Now, Paul wasn't tortured physically. But the very knowledge it was God striking him down shook him up and shook him in his mind spiritually. And suddenly, he realized that he was wrong. He was going the wrong way. He was doing the wrong thing. He was evil, and he was doing an evil thing. And he suddenly realized that. And his whole attitude and his intent in life changed. He had been persecuting in dynamic zeal. He, he, he was, you know, some people are just so, I don't know, insipid. There's no life in them, it seems. They're not dynamic. They're not forceful. They just go along so easily. Paul was not like that. He was a real vigorous man. And now when God turned him around the other way, he became a vigorous crusader for uh, for Christ. Well, I think maybe crusader is the wrong way because he wasn't going out trying to get people saved any more than Christ was. But his life was wrong. He was going the wrong way. And he made a surrender. Notice again in verse 6. He trembling. And astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And he began to obey from that minute on. And his whole life changed. He turned around and started to go the other way, started to live a different kind of life altogether. So Paul didn't become a Christian just in his own goodness. He was so good that he says, well, I'm going to accept Christ. No, in his goodness, he was breathing out flowers of the Christians. He wanted to see them slaughtered if he could. And he had to realize how wrong he was. Now, how was I struck down? I've often said I was struck down in an entirely different way than Paul was. Well, I was. I was struck down the course I was living in was altogether different when I was just a kid 16 years of age I, I, I was suddenly inspired with ambition and a man that employed me on a summer vacation job told me that I was going to just do great things in life I was going to go places he he flattered me, but he encouraged me, and he gave me slaps on the back and told me I was really going to do things. And I began to almost believe it. I never believed anything like that before. And then I became ambitious at age 16. 
but I knew that ambition meant a desire plus the hard effort and the work to accomplish that desire, and I meant I knew it meant putting forth a great effort. Now, what I became desirous of was all carnal and physical in this world. I wanted to be... I began to want to be considered when I was mature, and I was only 16 then, but I wanted to be considered successful by a successful man. I, it wasn't that I wanted a lot of money. I wanted some of the things money would buy, that's true, but I wasn't thinking about just hoarding money or anything like that. But I wanted to be looked on as successful by successful men. And I became filled with self-confidence. And I began, while I was still in high school, spending a lot of time in the public library studying other books besides the high school assignment, in philosophy and in business administration and other things of that sort that I'd find in the library, not fiction. I had been reading a lot of fiction. I read about Dick Merriwell and Frank Merriwell and all of those things, and even Nick Carter. I don't think any of you remember that far back. That was before I was 16. But now I began to read serious things. I was filled with ambition. And I became quite successful. I made a self-analysis and examination to avoid fitting the proverbial square peg in a round hole, to find where I belonged, where I could be a success in life. I chose the profession I was succeeding in it. And by the time I was 28, I was making what in today's dollar value would be a, at least a quarter of a million dollars a year. Not very many young, young men of 28 have gone that far. And I have been quite successful. And then, in 1920, I was struck down. In 1920, there was a temporary flash depression. It was a very serious depression as following the end of World War I, which ended in 1918. And in 1920, it struck this country, and all of my clients that uh, were responsible for my income were firms like the J.I. Case people and farm implement people, and like uh, John Deere and Company, the Moline Plow Works, the Avery Company, uh, a, a great adding machine company and other companies like that and every one of them went into the receivership and lost everything they had the companies oh Goodyear Tire and Rubber was another one of my clients at that time they also failed now the company name was continued that new management was put in new uh, well, uh, new stocks were offered and new capital came in, new management was installed, and the companies came back up again, but the same people that were in it lost everything they had. And my business was totally swept away from under my feet. It wasn't my fault. I didn't bring on that depression. Now, in 1924... I took a trip that took 18 days from Des Moines, Iowa, out to Salem, Oregon. There were no cross-country highways in those days. It was just either mud roads in Iowa, dirt roads, and some gravel roads when we got farther west. And we had blowouts of tires and everything else in the Ford Sliver. And uh, we finally arrived out in Oregon in, uh, in, well, we were 18 days through that summer of 1924. Well, I had begun to build another business in the advertising field, and I was doubling the business of all of my clients. My work was eminently successful, and it had been hard to come back. I'd been struck down. Now I was regaining confidence again, and then all of a sudden, Something happened that all of my clients were stricken and could not expend money for 
local advertising any further. My business was suddenly swept away from me, and I had every client all through Oregon and Washington in my field. It took the life out of me. I had been ambitious. I wanted to succeed. Everything, and it just seemed, I said I was King Midas in reverse. You know, everything King Midas touched turned into gold. Everything I touched turned into nothing. I just thought I'm, I'm King Midas in reverse. And all the confidence had gone out of me. I was a whip-beaten man. I was reduced to poverty. That's the time when you've heard me say that I had... I had been making a quarter of a million dollars a year before that. I had those rights of shoes you've heard me talk about. They had holy soles. One pair, that's all I had, with holes in the sole. Yeah, the suit, I, I, I had a suit for every day in the week. The one I wore was it. The only one I had, and it was threadbare. Hardly presentable any longer. It was winter up in Oregon. I had a hole that big in the hip of the only overcoat I had, and it was only a top coat, and it was a cold winter. But I had finally been converted. I said, when I was in that condition, I was challenged, and I had to begin studying the Bible. And I began to realize that everything I had been taught was wrong. And I let God erase everything I'd ever believed out of my mind. I turned around and started to go the other way. I had been whipped. I had been beaten. And finally, I was conquered by God. I didn't just get and receive and accept Christ. I gave myself to him. Of course, I accepted him, but you know what I mean. It was more than just getting something. It was giving my whole life to him. And I did it in poverty. I was beaten down. I had gone through an emotional beating, a terrible beating. And now I began to have a new kind of confidence. Totally different. It was not self-confidence. I began to have the faith of Christ. I began to have a confidence that Christ well, well, like they had in the morning service this morning, the song, I Will Never Walk Alone. I knew I wouldn't have to walk alone, that Christ would be with me if I would be with him. But I, I had to go his way. I had to be conquered by him. I don't believe anyone receives the Holy Spirit until the human spirit has been conquered by God and his spirit. I often think of a spirited young colt. You try to get on him, and he'll try to throw you. You can't do a thing with him. You've got to break him. He's got to be conquered. And then you do have a still spirit in horse, but he becomes of great value, but he has to be broken. You know, God has to break our wills and break us, and we have to be brought to the place of surrender to him. How many of you have gone through such an experience? Or have you, just in your own goodness, seen the truth? Yeah, well, that's, that's true. I'm going to accept it. I'm so good that I just want to accept it. I'm going to be a Christian from here on. I wonder if you have really received the Spirit of God. I wonder if you get it that easily. I didn't. The Apostle Paul didn't. I didn't, and Paul didn't. I had to be whipped. I had to be conquered. I wrote something here I wanted. Well, I had to confess and admit how wrong I had been. I, not only that I had done wrong, but I was wrong. And I was wrong through and through. I had to come to a new attitude in life. A new purpose in life. Altogether something new and something altogether different. Now I'd like to show you something about David. 
You know, a lot of people would never understand how David could ever be called a man after God's own heart. Well, how could he be called a man after God's own heart? Look at the things he did. God wouldn't let him build the temple in Jerusalem when he asked God. He said, God thought it was a good idea, all right, and wanted it built. But he said, he said he wouldn't let David build it because David is a man of war. He shed so much blood in killing people in battle. And not only that, but when God told him not to take a census of his nation, he went ahead and did it anyway and disobeyed God deliberately. And God really whiffed him and punished him for that. And another time, he saw a woman taking a bath out of his window, and I guess her window was open. She must have been next door somewhere from his palace. Well, he was the king, so he told some of his servants, bring that woman over here. And she became pregnant. And her husband was away from home in the war and the battle. And now David was in trouble. He got this other man's wife pregnant. And David didn't know what to do. So he got word to the general of the army and said, send this man back home. And when he got there, he said, I, you, you stay home for a couple of nights with your wife before you go back. But he said, no, he says, I'm not going to enjoy going to bed with my wife when all the rest of my buddies down there are out there fighting and, 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 and they don't get to be in a nice shelter of a beautiful home or anything like that. So he, he just slept outside. He didn't even go in the house. Now David was really up against it. He didn't know what to do. He was like a rat in a corner, trapped. And he tried anyway to get out of it. Now he did a worse thing yet. After he had committed adultery with another man's wife, now he sent a note by this same man to the general of the army and said, put him up in the forefront of the battle where he'll get killed himself. And he was killed. David now became a murderer. And God sent Nathan, the prophet, to tell him what he had done. Now I'm going to show you what David went through in the 51st Psalm. Here was a prayer of David when he woke up and finally realized what had happened. Most people would say to any man that's done those things, uh, he's no good. God couldn't use a man like that. And yet, I, I, I think they must sit in judgment of God calling a man like David a man after God's own heart. Well, here's why David's a man after God's own heart. Look at this prayer. He was praying out to God. He said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according uh, uh, unto thy... Uh, unto the uh, multitude of thy tender mercies blot out my transgressions now he's beginning to admit his transgressions he's admitting how wrong he was wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity my iniquity cleanse me from my sin now he's confessing it for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me And then, notice verse 10. I won't read all of it, but just notice in his prayer in verse 10. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. He confessed his sin. And David never did it again. Brethren, every one of you has sinned. You may think you haven't sinned as bad as someone else. And most people think if other people haven't found it out, they're all right, just as long as nobody knows it. Well, let me tell you, God knows every sin you've made. Every one of you has sinned, and God knows all about it. Every one. And you better be sure they're forgiven before you take the Passover. Now, maybe they already are forgiven. I, I don't mean asking them a million times over to forgive it. Once they're forgiven, they're forgiven. But you better be sure they have been. And if they have, that's wonderful.
I hope they have been already. Notice now from Ephesians, the second chapter. The very beginning of the second chapter, and you hath he quickened or made alive uh, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Every one of us has been spiritually dead in trespasses and sins, trespasses against God and God's law. We were spiritually dead. But now, if we have the Holy Spirit, if we have repented, if we have been conquered and received the Holy Spirit of God, that changes everything. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, who is Satan, and he's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. And every one of us is a child of disobedience and has been, and the spirit of God has worked in us. I'm going to read something I hadn't thought of that I think of just now. First John, the first chapter. First John, the first chapter. Verse 3, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Here we are having fellowship. Here we are in a church service. You know that in spirit, both God the Father and Jesus Christ are right here in this auditorium this afternoon with us. And we're having fellowship and communion with them this afternoon right now. I love that beautiful song that the choir sang in the morning service. You never walk alone. The two cannot walk together except they be agreed. And once we have really repented, once we have been conquered, you can't walk with Christ if you don't agree with him. You can't walk with God the Father until you've repented because in your sins you weren't agreeing with him. You've got to make a surrender. And I mean a real surrender and it's a changed life. A changed attitude changed goal in life, a changed purpose altogether. But then you're going to sin again, even after that. And you all have, ever since you've been, con uh, since you've been converted, I mean. Every one of you has, has, has sinned, more or less. So, we read here in the ninth verse, If we, we Christians, now this is talking about Christians, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We have sinned, but we have not disagreed with him. We didn't mean to sin, but we slipped up. We forgot, or maybe we got careless. Maybe we hadn't continued in prayer as often as we should. Maybe we slipped up a little while. Maybe you've sinned since you were converted. But if we confess those sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, it goes right on in the next chapter, my little children, these things right under you, those in the church, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate, that is a believer, with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propiti propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the whole world. It shows that he meant if we in the church sin, he will forgive us. But don't change your main attitude and your aim, own, your main purpose. And you may still have the Holy Spirit. But if you do not repent, if you do not acknowledge it, and then you continue on, pretty soon you'll just be lost entirely. I like to picture it this way. You're in 
a thick wooded forest. Trees are so thick you can't see even ten feet ahead of you. Not as far as the meet of the front row down there. I've been in the over in the the, uh, the, uh, the the big sandy campus that used to be just that thick in wood and brush. You couldn't even see ten or fifteen feet. But if you're in a in a, in a in a big forest on a dark moonless night, no light, no moon, and there's only one way out, and there is a light there, and that light is going out, and you follow that light. It'll lead you right out. But if you don't follow that light and you go any other way, you, you're not going to see very far. And I tell you, inside a, a little time, that light is lost. You won't find it again. You don't know which way to go now to find it. And you can't tell which is east, west, north, or south. Not at least until the next day. You'll be lost in the woods. Now, the Bible is a lamp under our feet. But that lamp must have oil in it. You read that in the 25th chapter of Matthew, for just before Christ's coming, it's really speaking to the Laodicean church then, and half of the virgins who had been Christians had let the oil go out of their lamps. Their lamps are the Bible, but the oil is the Holy Spirit within them. Speaking, of course, in uh, figurative or in... Uh, uh, symbolic language. And I've noticed those who go out from among us, they go off on some one point, or maybe two points, and always, if they don't repent, it is not long till they've gone off on another doctrine, and then another, and then pretty soon they're just gone all together. And it's too late. Now, if you make a mistake, if you sin, and you confess your sins. You better do it quick and do it immediately. And it wasn't too late. And he will be faithful and just to forgive you your sins. And to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But brethren, some have gone out from this body and this church. And they didn't confess their sins right away. And then they began to make another sin. And then another. And they've just given up altogether. They don't believe anything anymore. They've gone farther and farther and farther away. Now, it's good to have this Passover season come once a year. And it's good to have us check up once in a while and to remember that whenever we do make a mistake, maybe it was thoughtlessness, maybe it was deliberate even, but you come to yourself and you come to realize it, repent and repent quick. Don't say I'm unworthy to repent. You're never too unworthy to go to God and ask for forgiveness and ask him to get you back on the track. This whole church had been going wrong and we've had to get back on the track. Brethren, you have to keep yourself on the track privately and individually. I have to keep myself on the track. I know where I was beginning to get off a little bit. And maybe you didn't realize I was getting myself back on the track while I've been getting you all back on it. You thought I was just so good I was getting you all back, so don't kid yourself. I'm human too, brother. But I've been trying to get me back on the track too, along with you. Let's all get back. Because it isn't going to be much longer until Christ is going to come. And I hope we'll all be together so we can rise and be changed from mortal to immortal in the moment in the twinkling of an eye and rise to meet Christ in the air as he comes. What a glorious time that can be. Only if we really repent, if we acknowledge when we're wrong, if we confess it, if we're willing to change, I've had to even confess that I'd misled the church on some things. We've had to change. When I found I was wrong, I changed it. I don't have to prove it. I can admit I'm wrong. I've proved that. I've proved it before the whole church more than once. 
But the time has come to examine. Oh, there's one more. <laughs> well, I still have time. I wanted to read one more scripture. First Corinthians 13, 5. Or Second Corinthians 13, 5. Where it says, Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobate. It's not too late. You wouldn't be here this afternoon if you were already reprobate. It's not too late. I don't know, uh, maybe some of you have seen. Maybe you've gotten off the track a little bit. You can get back on and get back quick and don't delay. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't let the sun go down until you're back on. Examine yourselves before the passage. Now, it says, I read to you, let every man examine himself and so on and take of that passage. Of course, that is speaking about how you take it worthily, uh, unworthily, uh, rather than taking it worthily. But we have to examine ourselves, and we should before the Passover, and to know that we are back on the track ourselves, walking with Christ, as we should be. So, I wish I could be here with you for this Passover. But it seems like duty calls me away. I have to go to Oman, Jordan, and maybe someday you'll realize how necessary it was that I go. And so I'll pray that God be with all of you. And I would like to have your prayers continue for me, and I'm sure that they will. Thank you all.